Good morning. Okay, just need to make sure we're up and running. We're going to start today's service by singing Victory in Jesus. So I'd like for everybody to roll your window down a little bit. And everybody sing. Now, I won't be able to hear you unless you really, really sing loud. So sing really, really loud. We're just going to sing the chorus twice. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me and I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that you're here this morning. I'm grateful to be able to gather with you in this unusual way again. I know that things continue to change, but as I said last week, the one thing that won't change is that we will continue to worship the Lord. I don't know exactly what will happen in the weeks to come, but for now, us worshiping the Lord looks like this. But I'm so grateful that we are able to actually gather together, even if we can't be close to one another and we have to stay in the cars. I love that we're able to come together at the same time and hear the word of God to sing his praises. It brings me joy. So I'm grateful that you're here this morning. I'm grateful to be able to be standing here before you and bringing you the word of God. So I, I hope this morning is worshipful. That's what we want to do is to gather and worship the Lord. I know that there's all sorts of distractions perhaps uh, around us, but I want us to tune in and worship the Lord. I'm grateful that even though it was pouring down rain last night, the Lord has given us a sunny day uh, so that we can make this work, that this is possible. So let's jump right in and worshiping the Lord. I want us to focus our minds, our hearts on him in the reading of Ephesians chapter 1. Beginning in verse 15, Paul has just outlined in the first 14 verses the salvation we have in our God. And he goes on to tell this to the church in Ephesus. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for who you are, that you are still God. We thank you that we are able to meet this morning, that you have let the sun shine so that we can enjoy a beautiful morning of worship together. I thank you that you are still seated on your throne and working out your will, and I pray that this morning you will clear all distractions from heart and mind, that we might come to worship you in spirit and in truth. God, we pray that if anyone here this morning does not know you as Lord, that you would soften their hearts that they might come to know you. And I pray that you would strengthen us as believers, especially during these unusual times, to continue to leave this place and love you and love neighbor. God, help us to worship this morning. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God takes real good care. 
every day is the goodness I can see. I serve him with gladness, and I have no regrets. For he walks beside me. Why should I worry? Why should I dread faith? Tis strength in every day. His guiding light. Each step along the way to God I can pray. His goodness and his mercy every day is mine. And then I can count on Jesus in any time. You see, God takes good care of me. Every morning, noon and night, he's taking good care of me. And I praise his name. Throughout eternity, and I'll serve him with gladness. I have no regrets, because he walks beside me. Why should I worry? Why should I pray and faith? To strengthen every day, his guiding light. Each step along the way to God I can pray. His goodness and his mercy every day is mine. And then I can count on Jesus sing any time you see. God takes good care of me, good care of me. I know that God takes good care of me. Good care of me. Amen. Amen. God does take good care of us. And I want us to see that good care that God takes of his people in his word. And, and I've said it before, but I'll say it again this morning. Sometimes when Christians are reading the scriptures, we come down with a case of BBS, boring Bible syndrome. That is when we begin to look at a familiar story, even though it might be packed with amazing details, with a roller coaster of emotion and passion, and not to mention the glory of God filling the pages of the scripture, sometimes we approach it and read it as though we were reading an entry in a dictionary. We read it as a means to an end. Okay, what does this have for me today? And sometimes we completely miss the story. And so I don't want us to have boring Bible syndrome this morning, but I do want us to look at a familiar text. And so if you have a Bible with you, go ahead and turn to the book of Exodus. We will be in Exodus chapter 14, reading verses 10 through 14. But first I want to set the scene for you. You likely know what is going on, but I really want us to begin to picture all that's involved here in the book of Exodus. The people of God, the Israelites, are enslaved in Egypt. Even that, we don't want to gloss over. Uh, they are not free, but rather they, real families, real moms and dads with real children, real grandparents with real grandchildren, are slaves in a foreign land. They are serving the Egyptians, forced to do harsh, harsh labor, and they are not free to do as they please. And so you can imagine their longing for a day when they won't be slaves any longer. But when they'll be able to take their kids and be free in a land of their own. And that's exactly what God does. He sends Moses and Aaron, and he works miraculously through his creation to bring plagues upon the people of Egypt, and Pharaoh then lets the people go. And so you can just imagine for a moment the joy and excitement they must have. They now are leaving Egypt. They might have tears of joy streaming down their face. They're excited. They hug their children tight saying, little Johnny, which of course is a very Jewish name, little Johnny, we, we are going to be free. You're not going to have to be a slave. We're, we're going to our own land to be our own people. But if I was an early 2000s TV commercial, I would say, but wait, there's more because there is more. Pharaoh changes his mind, and he gathers up the people of Egypt, and he gathers up the mighty men and the warriors, and he sends them out to go in the best chariots, on the best horses to go, and to take back the people of Israel. Can you imagine the people of Israel sitting there that day, 
maybe sitting down for a meal, talking about what they're going to do in this new freedom, this new land, and all of a sudden, that same Johnny he pokes his neighbor and says, hey, Billy, again, another very Jewish name, Billy, do you, do you see that? It kind of looks like a, a dust storm or something. And Billy pokes Sally and says, Sally, what do you think? And, and Sally puts on her glasses to see a bit closer. Again, a very uh, a Jewish thing that they would have had back then, of course. Sally puts on her glasses and says, I don't think that's a dust storm. I say, well, what is it, locusts or what? Are they? It looks like it's coming near us. And Sally says, I think it's an army. I think the Egyptians are coming near us. And at that very moment, you can imagine this spread. It spread the word all across the Israelite camp. They're coming back. And those same tears of joy have now turned into tears of terror. They were horrified. If you remember the people, the last time they were in Egypt, God had just sent the plague to kill all the firstborn there in Egypt. The people of Egypt were not coming to exchange pleasantries. It's not as though Johnny left his iPhone back in Egypt and they were just coming to kindly return it to him. No, they were coming back with a vengeance. They were coming back to kill, to capture, and to enslave. And you can see just how terrified the people are in our text. Exodus chapter 14, beginning in verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified, and they cried out to the Lord. And they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt? You brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die here in the desert. The Israelites thought it was a sure thing. Many of them were going to die, or they'd be enslaved and brought back to Egypt only to be slaves again, working even harder under forced labor, even more than they were before. You can imagine the terror that they felt. But Moses responds. Going on in verse 13, Moses answers the people. He says, do not be afraid. I know you're in your cars right now, and I can't hear you, but repeat those words after me. Do not be afraid. He says, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. Why? The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. In summary, Moses says to the people, don't be afraid, calm down. And can you imagine Johnny and Billy and Sally looking up at Moses as if he had just grown another head? Don't be afraid. Have you seen the circumstances that we're in? We've got the Red Sea on this side and we can't cross, and the Egyptians coming on this side. What do you mean, don't be afraid? But Moses was right. They didn't need to be afraid, and the text helps us to understand why. For one, the circumstances really did look grim, but God was not worried. All throughout chapter 14, we see a God who is completely in control, not frantically worried about what Pharaoh was going to do next, but calm and cool and collected. God was in control. In fact, if you have your Bible, look back at verse 4 of our text. Verse 4, God himself is speaking, and he says, And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them, the Israelites. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. Verse 4 tells us it is in fact God's doing that Pharaoh changes his mind and runs after the Israelites so that God may fulfill his purposes, that he may be glorified. God is completely in control. From the standpoint of the Israelites, things look grim. It doesn't look good for them. But from the standpoint of God, everything is going exactly as he has purposed. Not only this, but the Israelites need not fear because God had delivered them before, and he wasn't about to forget about them now. Remember, this is the same people that was just brought out of Egypt by God. And God would continue to remind them of this all throughout the books of the Old Testament. Israel would think that things are ending terribly, not believing in the promises of God, not having faith, and God would remind them, don't you remember that I am God, the one who brought you up out of Egypt? God hadn't forgotten about them now. 
not only this, but God is for them. He cares for them. He loves them, and he's fighting for them. That's what we saw in verse 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That ought to be enough right there to calm their fears. The God who created the universe, the God who spoke it into existence, is now on their side. And if they really believed this, it wouldn't be them who would be in fear. They would be telling the Egyptians to fear because God was fighting for them. The circumstances may have looked grim, but God was not worried. He was at work. And the same is true today. Now, I recognize that our circumstances are far different. As coronavirus continues to spread, and as people continue to wonder what's going to happen, it's much, much different, I recognize, than the Israelites being terrified at the coming Egyptian army. And yet, the same God that was with Israel in the desert is with us today. God has not changed. And so I want us to see the truth about God, even in differing circumstances, that applies to us today. The truth is the same. God is still in control. We may feel very out of control. We have people all over the world wondering what's going to happen to them. Are they going to be able to be healthy? What happens if they get sick? Are the doctors going to be able to care for them? What's going to happen to their loved ones? How can they keep them safe? What's going to happen to their jobs? Are they going to be able to feed their families, to pay their bills? There's all sorts of questions, and we look around right now and recognize that perhaps circumstances are grim. Perhaps we do feel out of control. But even if we feel out of control, we trust in a God who is in control. He is not worried. He's not frantically trying to come up with a plan to combat the coronavirus. I'll be the first to say that I don't understand the ins and outs of God's sovereignty. I don't know exactly how God works out all things to the purposes of his will. I don't know exactly how God works in the world, but I do believe in the scriptures. And the scriptures show us again and again and again that God is working for his people. And never once is he worried. God was not worried when the Egyptians came for Israel. He wasn't worried when Joseph was sold into slavery or when David was face to face with the giant or when Jonah was tossed into the raging waters. God wasn't worried when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were standing before the fiery furnace or when Daniel was tossed into the lion's den. He wasn't worried when the waters raged around the disciples' boat with Jesus sleeping there on the deck. He wasn't worried when Paul was thrown into jail or when the church faced persecution. We serve a God who is not worried, frantically trying to work things out to the best of his ability, but we serve rather a God who is in complete control. Again, I don't know exactly how that works out, but I know it ought to give us confidence for today. Circumstances can look grim from a human standpoint, but now is the time that we have faith in a God of the scriptures. We hold on to this. I don't know what God is doing through the coronavirus. I don't know when he will put an end to it. But I do know that we need not be worried. If we simply look around at our circumstances, we might have reason. But when we look to Christ, we recognize that he is fulfilling his purposes. It's often easy in hindsight, not so easy in the moment. But when circumstances look grim, we hold to the truth that God is at work. And not only this, but he is at work for his glory and our good. Just as in our text we saw in Exodus 14, 4, that God was bringing about his purpose of glorifying his name, making it known to all the people that he was God. And in verse 14, that he was for the Israelites. He was fighting for them. Even though we're not the Israelites, it is true that God is still for us. Christians, believers. Romans 8, 28, an often quoted verse says, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Again, I can't tell you exactly what God is up to or how he is working things out for our good, but I know that he is not working to tear his church down. I know he is not working against his people, but God is working for our good in every circumstance. Now again, I'll be quick to say, this doesn't mean that we will never face struggles. It doesn't mean that we won't face trials. It doesn't mean that we won't get 
sickness. We won't get the coronavirus. That may be plastered on Facebook, but that's not plastered in my Bible. It, because in my Bible, I see in Romans 8, 28, even though he works for the good of those who love him, Paul is writing that in a paragraph about suffering. So he is not suggesting that Christians will have an easy, breezy life, never to face any trials or struggles. But he is suggesting that even though we will face trials, we are going to have all things work out for us for our good because God is still in control. God's gracious activity is often hard to see, but in those moments we hold on to the gospel. In those moments where you look around, you might even now be saying, well, pastor, how can he be working for my good? I just lost my job. Or how can he be working for my good? My family member, my loved one is sick. How can he be working for my good? How can you stand there and say that God cares for me, that he loves me? Well, Christian, hold on to the gospel. The good news that even though we are sinners, even though we have gone against God's decree for us to enjoy and love and obey him, God has sent his son to die for you. He cares for you enough, rather than giving you what we deserve, that is death and hell, he has graciously given us life and heaven by faith. He sent his son to die that we might be brought in as sons and daughters in the family of God. If we ever doubt the love of God for us, we need only to look back to this gospel, this good news that proves to us God's faithfulness and love toward his people. And it's true that God has done this, but we shouldn't think that he has only done that. It's not as though in Exodus 14, God saved the people out of slavery only to say good luck in the wilderness. God stayed with them, and God stays with us now. It's not as though he sent Christ to die only to leave us to fend for ourselves now. He is still with us, and he is still working. It's hard to see in the moment. Sometimes we get stressed trying to figure out all that's going on. But in hindsight, it's easy to have faith. But hindsight, faith is really no faith at all. God calls us to have faith in him and trust in him even when our circumstances look grim. And it ought to affect the way that we live. I'll admit to you, I've been preaching this text to myself all week. The past two weeks, I've been stressed a bit, not sleeping very well, worried about some of the things that are going on with church. How are we going to do church? What further restrictions might be put in place to keep us from doing what we want to do to worship the Lord? What's going to happen? I haven't been sleeping well, but I've been preaching this text to myself. Taylor, if you really believe that God is who he says he is in his word, then you need not worry. Moses' words have been ringing in my own ear. Do not fear. God is for you. You need only to be still. Church, I'd encourage you this morning not to face this situation with a lack of faith, but with faith. Don't wait until we're out of it to look back and say God is good. Proclaim that God is good even now. He is at work. He is not worried, and we have reason to trust in God. I think of the disciples as they were in the boat with Jesus, and Jesus took a nap, and the disciples began to see the waters raging around them, and these were fishermen. These were people who knew their way around the boat, around the waters, and they were terrified, and they shook Jesus awake and said, Jesus, don't you care for us? And Jesus rebuked them, saying, do you still not have faith? Again, I'm preaching that to myself. In times where the waters seem shaky, in times when the circumstances look grim, it is time for the church to have faith in God, the God of the scriptures who is not worried but who is at work. We're not in control, but we have a God that we can trust in. He cares for us. He is fighting for us. When George wakes up in the morning, for some reason he is always hungry. We feed him, and we feed him a lot, and yet he still is always hungry. And he'll wake up in the morning, and he'll beg us to go and fix breakfast. He's like the people in the desert, the Israelites in the desert throughout Exodus, when they complained to Moses, Moses, why did you bring us out here just to die? Aren't you going to give us some water and some food? What have you done? That's how George wakes up in the morning. Mommy, Daddy, you just going to let me die here in the house? Why aren't you bringing us food? And we tell George the same thing every morning. George, do we feed you every day? 
Every morning when, when you get up, don't we give you breakfast? They'll say yes. We say we take care of you. You need only to be patient. And that word is true for us this morning. God cared for you last month. He hasn't stopped caring for you now. God cared for you in salvation. He hasn't stopped caring about you now. We must only be patient, be still, and not fear. We don't need to look up to God and say, God, what are you doing? He is at work. He is not worried. He is fighting for his people. He's proven his faithfulness and love, and it has not ended now. We must trust in him, even when we can't see what he's doing. And let me add that the world is watching. The world is looking to see how people respond to the coronavirus. And I pray that the world not find us shaking in fear as the Israelites did when the Egyptians were coming. I pray that they don't find us shaking in fear, not having faith in the God we have proclaimed all this time. But rather, let them find us confident hopeful still. And then I pray that they will turn and ask us the question, why is it that you're confident? Why is it that you're hopeful? And I pray that we can respond with a defense to give the hope that is within us as the scriptures command us. We as Christians may have confidence. Even though the circumstances look grim, God is not worried. He is at work. I'd urge you this morning, if you don't know the Lord, to come to know him you may also have that same hope, that same confidence. It doesn't take a pastor. It doesn't take an aisle, a set of steps. It doesn't take a special prayer. It takes you recognizing that you have sinned, not living for God, turning away from that, and instead living your life for Jesus, who is worthy of your praise. He died for you that you, by faith, may live in him. I'd encourage you this morning to have faith. If that's something you've done for the first time this morning, I would love to stick around and stay six feet away from you while you're in your car and talk to you about the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But you as Christians listening to me now, I hope that you will leave this place not in fear, not in stress, but rather confident in God that you would be able to proclaim to those around you that you don't know exactly what God is up to, but you trust that he is still good as he has been for all of eternity. God is faithful. God is at work. He is not worried, and we don't need to be either. As we close this morning, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads in prayer with me, I want to read you a prayer from the book, The Valley of Vision. It's a collection of Puritan prayers and devotions. And this is the prayer, if you'll pray with me. My God, you are all my good in times of peace, my only support in days of trouble, my one sufficiency when life shall end. Help me to see how good your will is in all, and even when it crosses mine, teach me to be pleased with it. Grant me to feel your care in fire and food and every providence, and to see that your many gifts and creatures are but your hands and fingers taking hold of me, your bottomless fountain of all good. I give myself to you out of love, for all I have or own is yours. My goods, my family, my church, myself, it to do as with you will, to honor yourself by me and by all mine. If it be consistent with your eternal counsel, counsels, the purpose of your grace and the great ends of your glory, then bestow on me the blessings of your comforts. If not, let me resign myself to your wiser determinations. It is in this we pray. Amen. Our benediction. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. See you next week.